Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest lecture. And this is going to be probably a four or five parter. It's on a very important topic, misdiagnosis in body CT. Now, the truth is, if I wanted to cover every potential misdiagnosis, we could be giving not a five parter, but more like a 50 parter or a 500 parter. There is something you can miss on every scan, whether it's because you overlook something, you didn't see something, there was a bad scan protocol, there was a lack of IV or oral contrast. There are so many different ways we can miss things. And what I want to do in this talk is talk about some of the generic problems we have, as well as solutions, obviously. Just giving you problems is not going to help anybody. But also talk about solutions, and then spend time going through common sources of error and how we do our best to avoid them. So let's get started. I also recognize that, you know, from the beginning of CT, there have always been pitfalls, but pitfalls often change. Some things that are pitfalls become easier to diagnose. Think about pulmonary emboli. They were really hard to diagnose when the scanners had lots of motion, when it was long scan times. And with the newest CT scanners, PEs, even small PEs, are easier to detect. We're much better with a uh, higher true positive rate and a lower false positive and false negative rate. And then, of course, we now have AI, and we'll speak about AI a few different times during uh, this five-part session. And AI makes our accuracy even better than the best of us. Now, in the COVID era, we're kind of getting out of the COVID era, though. I don't think we're ever going to be out of the COVID era, at least mentally, for many, many years. And hopefully COVID will remain a, uh, a distant memory. But it really showed some of our limitations in terms of technologist and radiologist staffing levels. Um, there's no doubt that radiology is at a real critical point now because we have so much work and not as many faculty as we would like. And that's true whether you're in private practice or academics. In the past, there were a few companies. Nighthawk was one of them that did remote reading. Now there's so much remote reading. I think half the people at times work remote. And there are many people who work full-time remote, both in academics and private practice. And it's not remote where people are working overnight coverage, which was the main reason for Nighthawk, but it's just remotely during the day. Even at Hopkins, we have five full-time people who work remote, two are in California, so they work a lot of the later shifts where our 12 to 8 is their 9 to 5, benefit for everybody. We also have people in New York, people in Kansas so there's many different places, many different ways, and I'm not going to speak about teleradiology, but limited staffing is a problem. We know that the more you read beyond a certain point, the more likely you're going to make errors. So we really want to be careful. We want people to read a reasonable amount of work, but not to read too much because reading too much is not in the patient's best interest. Now, we also had problems with covid Everyone wore a mask. We really didn't give oral contrast. And so what happens is once you change something for roughly three years, it wasn't a three-week change. It was three years, essentially. You get into bad habits, and people were kind of skimping on giving oral contrast, positive and neutral, in the ER setting before. With COVID, it became worse. And then as we reached the end of COVID, we had IV contrast shortages. Who should get IV? Should you cut back volumes? Now, we're past those days, and I don't think we're going to see it again. Companies like GE are building new factories and increasing production and increasing supply lines. But all of a sudden, people started using lower volumes. Now, yes, we don't want to waste contrast, but for things like the liver, you need enough iodine to be able to pick up lesions. So simply cutting contrast volume to cut contrast volume is not necessarily good. In fact, it's necessarily bad. So you need to be very careful. And then, you know, there aren't that many CME activities anymore. There's a lot of things you can do on Zoom. There's a general fatigue people have. I ran meetings, four meetings a year for 35 plus years. Now we're not running any meetings. The cost of meetings are too high. The hotels, the airlines, all of those things. Plus people don't have funds to go to meetings. I think a lot of the societies will survive. 
But I think the meetings, the ones that the Hopkins ran, the ones that Penn ran, the ones that UCSF and Mayo, some of those will survive, but not surely at the level that we saw pre-COVID. Now, when you get down to it and you try to quantify errors, there's a really good work from the Institute of Medicine that comes out and should be coming out again very soon. And they had, you know, really very much looking at errors without trying to point fingers and just being, you know, honest what the numbers are. Conservative estimate that 5% of U.S. adults who seek outpatient care each year experience a diagnostic error. Postmortem exams, research spanning decades, have shown that diagnostic errors contribute to approximately 10% of patient deaths. 10% of deaths are due to medical error. Wow. Medical records review suggested diagnostic errors account for 6 to 17% of hospital adverse events. And diagnostic errors that are leading type of paid malpractice claims are almost twice as likely to have resulted in the patient's death compared to other claims and represent the highest proportion of total patient payments. So lots of problems and big numbers. The committee concluded that most people will experience one error in their lifetime, sometimes with devastating consequences. And despite the pervasiveness of diagnostic errors and the risk for serious patient harm, diagnostic errors have been largely unappreciated within the quality and patient safety movement in healthcare. Without dedicated focus on improving diagnosis, these errors will likely worsen as the delivery of healthcare and the diagnostic process continues to increase in complexity. I think we are paying more attention to errors and safety. That's true in academics and private practice, but again, probably not enough. And the biggest risk for error is physicians being overworked. And I think everyone will say that they really are overworked now. Now, in this article from the Institute of Medicine, they did focus a bit on radiology and select places. Perceptual or cognitive errors made by radiologists were a source of diagnostic error. In addition, incomplete or incorrect patient information, as well as insufficient sharing of information, may lead to the use of an inadequate imaging protocol, an incorrect interpretation of imaging results, or the selection of inappropriate imaging tests by a referring physician. Referring clinicians often struggle with selecting the appropriate imaging test, in part because of the large number of available imaging options and gaps in the teaching of radiology in medical schools. Every one of these comments is true. Clinicians learned what to order way back when, but things change. What's best today may not be the same as it was 10 years ago. And even if you say get a CT, how do you do the CT? Single phase, dual phase? The clinicians rely on the radiologists, and more and more the radiologists who are remote or really aren't as engaged are relying on the technologists to make the decision or have protocols which guide the process. Designing protocols for the individual patient becomes less and less, and the chance of error becomes more and more. In this article in the BMJ, medical error is the third leading cause of death in the U.S., but probably is actually higher than that because if you think about uh, death certificates, if someone missed a lung nodule three years ago when you would have been cured and now it was picked up a year ago when it was metastasizing or was larger and the patient dies, the death certificate says cause of death lung cancer. It doesn't say misdiagnosis. So the number of misdiagnosis, which really is never always known, is probably much more than reported. That's kind of obvious. And so with cancer and heart disease dropping in terms of numbers of deaths, medical error is surely going to be number one or two over the next couple of years. That's making the assumption it's not number one or two now. Now, McCarry in that article did make the point that human error is inevitable. And I think that's a very important thing to realize. As we try to develop things that are safer, no matter how good you are, you can make an error. Strategies to reduce death for medical care should include three steps, making errors more visible when they occur so their effects can be intercepted, having remedies at hand to rescue patients, and making errors less frequent by following principles that take human limitations into account. So we need to recognize that we will make mistakes, but we need to try to minimize or avoid mistakes by looking at ways of doing that. If you ask the question how often mistakes occur, 
the numbers will vary from different articles, but this article has a number that's pretty much stayed the same. In daily practice, the rate of interpretation error is between 3 and 4%. However, for studies that contain abnormalities, the error rate's higher, maybe 30%. Remember, people will say that with pancreatic cancer, a lesion two centimeters or less will be missed between 30 and 40% of the time. In retrospect, it's there, but a high miss rate. And that's also the biggest problem. The majority of errors were under reading. We just simply missed the finding. If you see a liver mass and you say hemangioma, but it's really hepatoma, someone else is gonna look at that liver lesion and perhaps get another study or help reach the right diagnosis. If you say the study is negative, it's possible no one's gonna look back at the study because it was negative. It's very, very important. In this article by Rosencrantz, misfindings rather than misinterpretations of detected abnormalities were the most common reason for abdominal pelvic CT report addendums. So when you think about it, as people put an addendum on a report, it's typically not because I measured something at 3 cm and it's really 3.5, or I said 3.5 and it's 3.2. It's because you totally miss something. When you look at the addendums, 84% in this one article were new findings, 5% an upgrade in severity, 4% a downgrade, and 7% other modifications. But 84% means that somebody missed something and someone else found it. There's always the question, are we reading too fast? What does it mean to read too fast? In this article by Sokolovska, they looked at just simply increasing the speed of reading based on your typical speed, and they found out that the error rate increased significantly. The average interpretation error rate of major misses among the five radiologists reporting at the faster speed was 26.6% compared to 10% at normal speed. That is very important because that means even the best clinicians, if they're reading too much, their error rate can nearly triple. Our study found a significant correlation between faster reading speed and the number of major misses. There's no doubt, none of us are going to say, oh, if I read 30 cases a day or 70, I probably miss the same. We all know that the more you read, the longer you work, the more likely you are to have errors. You need to be more careful. If you have a very busy day, at the end of the day, you want to slow down, not go faster. But sometimes, you know, you're tired and things happen. In this article by Ivanovich, uh, the, what they wanted to do is they looked at neuroradiology and they wanted to look at error rates based on shift volume and when the shifts occurred. And their conclusions were errors were associated with higher volume shifts were primarily perceptual and clinically significant. We need national guidelines establishing a range of what is safe to read in a single day. Very important article. There was a significant difference between mean volume of interpreted studies on shifts when an error was made compared to shifts and when no error was made. And between shifts when perceptual error was made compared to shifts when interpretation errors were made. Almost 60% of errors occurred in the ER inpatient setting, 84% were perceptual, and 91% clinically significant. So we're not talking about missing something that's not important, saying, oh, I missed a one centimeter Bosniak one cyst. That's not going to be important. We're talking about missing important things. And just a few more quotes from that Ivanovich article. Based on the findings of the study, we are considering instituting a ceiling of around 40 studies per day within our neuroradiology division once we're fully staffed. Well, they're probably reading, like most places, more than 50% more than that. And when are you going to be fully staffed? Maybe not in any of our lifetimes. People also talk about double reading. Remember the old days MAMA was double read? Well, these days, and I have no doubt that if two people read something, it should do better. But these days, we have a hard time getting things read one time. I also should make the point, and I'll comment on it, that someone will say as well, when you read with a resident or a fellow, perhaps you make less errors because there really is double reading. I do make the point that a lot of the errors I see are when the resident and the faculty reads together. And that's because, look, the residents are in training. They're going to miss things. They're supposed to miss things, okay? That's not the issue. 
But when you're an attending and you're reading on your own, you have a certain format that you read, you spend a lot of time, and you're reading because you're dictating and you're looking at every single thing in a controlled fashion that you're used to. When you're reviewing a study with a resident or a fellow, you're look at the words, you're reviewing a study. You don't say you're reading a study with a fellow or resident, you're reviewing a study, which means you're listening mainly to what they said. They kind of control the, the motion and you're just seeing if what they said is correct or not. If you watch someone read a film and you time them and you watch them check a study, they probably check a study in 30 to 50% less time or even more than that. I would bet you in the time it takes to read a study, you probably have checked three studies. So again, very, very important. Another thing in terms of overreading and histories, there's a lot of articles like this one that show um, here we're looking at interpreting exams from outside institutions. Ever rates of size 41% have been reported during the reinterpretation of outside CT and MR studies in patients with head and neck cancer. Okay. Now this has been reported with trauma, with pancreas. It's always in that 30% range. Now, to be fair, when you see the patient, you probably have more history. The patient's referred to a head and neck place, not to just the ER setting. So there are a lot of reasons why errors will occur, but we can see that if you have more knowledge about the patient, you make less errors. So one of the things, of course, is for the clinicians to give us more information. And again, recognizing when you have limited information, the error rate will increase. Here's another article to determine the rate and nature of significant discordances between community and subspecial ER radiologists performing cross-sectional imaging in trauma centers. Again, the same thing is true that you will see a significant increase in errors at the community hospital. Now, there are many reasons for errors. When you think about how we read films, we all read it in the same way, though we approach it differently. This article by Waite makes the point an understanding of the causes of interpretive errors can help in the development of tools to mitigate errors and improve patient safety. But, you know, that's easier said than done. He makes the point in this article also by Itchery, there are perceptual errors and interpretive errors. Perceptual errors account for up to 80% of errors and occur when an abnormality is present on an exam, but not seen. And I mentioned before, it's the misses. Interpretive errors, you can train on, you get better. What is that liver mass? What is that pancreatic mass? Is it a peanut, a PDAC, a multilocular cyst? The good news is once you have a tumor of the pancreas, you may give the wrong differential or the wrong diagnosis, but someone else is going to look at it. But if you read the study as normal, you're going to have more problems. We talk about biases. Look at all these different biases, anchoring bias, confirmation bias, availability bias, on and on. It gets to the point where you wonder how anybody ever reads the film correctly. So what do we need to do? We need to figure out a way, as Johnny Ivey, who was the founder, uh, I shouldn't say founder, that's a bad word, who developed the iPhone and iPad with Steve Jobs, his point is that our goal is to try to bring a common simplicity to what are incredibly complex problems so that you're not aware really of the solution. And that's what we need in radiology. We, meet, we need to make the workflow easier. Is that AI? Is that less cases a day? Or a combination of all the above? So let's do this. Let's stop here and let's come back about what we're doing and see you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.